Hi, today we're going to be talking about Ancient Rome. Ancient Rome is a culture that is going to be very much influenced by what the Greeks had established. In fact, we use the term classical to describe the art of Greece, Greece and Rome because their cultures in, in many ways were so similar. And the reason for this is because the Greeks were such a huge influence on the Romans. And the Romans are going to adapt or adopt a, lo a lot of Greek ideas. The Roman architecture and art was heavily influenced by Greek architecture and art. And even the Roman form of government, republicanism, where um, uh, people have elected representatives, was derived from the Athenian Greek concept of democracy, based in the humanist principles that man has the right to rule ourselves. I do want to refer to uh, this banner here, the SPQR, the Senatus Populisque Romanus, which means the Senate and the Roman people. The Romans took great pride in the fact that they were a republic and that the, the citizen of Rome uh, took great pride in being a citizen of Rome and having a government that represented them. So um, even the, the soldiers marched under the banner, when they marched under the banner of Rome, they actually marched under the banner of the Senate. Here's Rome at its height. Now Rome is a massive empire. And at, at its height, this is a culture that spread from Scotland to Baghdad, guys. It is a huge, it is a, it is a huge population with millions of people. Uh, and there were also major cities within the, the boundaries of Rome itself, not just the city of Rome. The Romans are going to become uh, incredible engineers because they have to build large-scale structures within their cities. Um, things like roads, things like sports arenas, things like shopping malls, things like um, large-scale public buildings to service these massive populations. So Rome is actually divided into three sort of major historical eras, though. The earliest era uh, when, was Rome ruled by the Etruscans. So the Etruscans are going to be the other major influence on Roman art next to the Greeks. And then Rome becomes a, a republic uh, with an elected senate uh, after that. And that is going to remain until the first century, around the first century AD, when uh, Rome will become an empire, and that's when it will really spread its borders. This map that you're seeing here is Rome at its height during, during its empire. Uh, this is a sort of recreation of the city of Rome itself. We'll see that the Romans borrow heavily in terms of art and architecture from the Etruscans and especially the Greeks. And while you will certainly see the influence of those two cultures in Greek and Roman stuff, um, the Roman, Roman engineers were able to build uh, especially architecture and public architecture on a scale that the Greeks could never dream of um, because the Romans had to take care of these large populations and they had to build these large buildings and so they became very, very good at designing materials and methods of construction to create massive structures. Rome has always been influenced by the Etruscans and the Greeks because of proximity. Um, if we go back to our map here, of course, you can see, um, you know, Rome was right next to uh, Etruria. It was um, associated with the Etruscans. It was under Etruscan rule, and there will be an Etruscan influence. Also, there were Greek colonies in Italy, and, and Greek culture um, for a period dominated the Mediterranean area. So there will always be a Greek influence. But this Greek influence becomes sort of uh, souped up, if you will. Um, because in the year 2011 BCE, uh, a general named Marcus Marcellus uh, conquers the Greek city of Syracuse, and he brings back a bunch of Greek stuff, a bunch of Greek art, a bunch of Greek writings, a bunch of Greek philosophy, a bunch of Greek everything. And this kind of brings a craze to Rome uh, for anything sort of Greek. And uh, the, the, the Roman culture is... is, is um, very much uh, influenced by uh, the Greek culture and art and architecture, and, and this really explodes after this uh, conquering of Syracuse. And even the, uh, the great Roman historian Livy says that there was a craze for works of Greece. Okay, so let's look at some Roman stuff. 
So what we have here is a small temple uh, located in Rome uh, dedicated to uh, the god Portunus, a god of harbors. We, of course, get the word port from this. And if you look at this temple, um, you can see that it is um, it should look very familiar. Uh, it is a, a temple that utilizes a Greek pediment. It uses Greek ionic columns, uh, but there's also a big uh, Etruscan influence here. Let's 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 compare side by side. Uh, if you look at the Etruscan influence, you can certainly see, um, and of course we know the, the Etruscans also had some Greek influence, but you can see the use of a pediment. Um, uh, also, the fact that is, this is not a peripteral or peristyle structure like a Greek temple would be, but it's a, it's a more typical Etruscan structure where you have sort of a, 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 a stair step leading up only to one side, the front of the building. Then you have a little porch area uh, with columns supporting the, uh, the roof. Uh, and uh, it is basically a small closed off rectangle that can only be entered from one side, like an Etruscan building. But it's like a, a, a Greek uh, temple in the fact that it's made from marble, in the fact that it uh, uses Greek Ionic um, capitals, but also even though it is not a peripteral or peristyle temple, meaning it has a colonnade all around it, it has a fake column all around it. It has a, what we call an engaged column, um, columns that are halfway embedded into the, the wall, giving it a sort of faux <laughs> peripteral look here. And this looks like pretty much a mashup of Greek and Etruscan uh, art. Uh, it's also lacking, I forgot to mention, the statuary on the roof line uh, that we see common to Etruscan art. Let's look at a temple slash well, marketplace, really. Uh, this is uh, the um, uh, uh, sanctuary of Fortuna Primigenia. This is the goddess of luck. This is in Palestrina, Italy. Uh, this comes from the late second century BCE. And this is a remarkable example of early Roman um, civic architecture, architecture that is meant to serve a whole lot of people. This is a huge temple complex. That's not just a temple, but there were, it's basically like a shopping mall uh, slash theater slash temple. So uh, the Romans became really, really good at um, handling large crowds of people. Think of like a Disneyland or a theme park where you have massive crowds of people and you have to direct where they go. Um, so this is built into a hillside and um, the structure is designed uh, with a series of ramps and stairways to sort of guide people uh, and their experience as they enter. But you, this is something we will often see in Roman art, especially our architecture, large civic architecture, is a, a sort of a design aesthetic that directs traffic and deals is exclusively with sort of crowd control and managing large crowds. Um, you'll also notice that the walls of this uh, are something very common that you will see in Roman Republican art, and that is a technique called opus incertum, or inserted work. Romans um, would often use concrete uh, as a base, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. Uh, for their structures, or they would use a brick structure and then cover it with concrete, and then they would embed stones or pebbles into the concrete walls to create this sort of textural effect. Um, the opus incertum is what it's called. It's inserted pebbles into a wall. Um, one of the things that made Roman buildings so strong and so powerful and able to withstand such heavy weights was the use of the arch. We should be familiar with this little architectural device. Um, this is called a post and lentil. And a post and lentil is perfectly serviceable. It had been in use, well, since the you know, Neolithic era. And many structures built throughout the world use this system. And we've seen it a ton already in Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and Greek architecture. And the, here's the problem with it, though. Here's a post and lentil. But the problem is if you put too much weight on top of it in the middle, it eventually will bend or even break. 
And that meant that depending on what kind of stone you were using, there was a limit to how tall you could make a building because the more, the taller the building, the more material, more mass, the more weight, kaboom, goes kaboom, right? So what the Romans used instead was an arch. Now they certainly didn't invent the arch, but the Romans used the arch in, an, in a structural way that no culture really before them had used. They sort of used the arch and variations of the arch throughout most or a good majority of their major architectural works. So what makes an arch so awesome? The arch is made up of a series of small trapezoidal cut stones called a voussoir or voussoir if you want to be fancy in French about it. And then the central voussoir is called the keystone. This uh, keystone does a lot of work as any pressure comes directly down from uh, the building above, it presses onto the keystone and these voussoirs. But instead of the pressure continuing straight downwards and leading into collapse, what happens to the weight is that it's distributed um, along the length. And so it's a lot stronger than a, a, a simple post and lintel system, which means you could make taller buildings. And the Romans, develop the um, arch into a bunch of different other uh, architectural elements that allowed them to build huge structures. So they realized you could take an arch and you could sort of stretch it out long ways and like on your upper left hand image here, create what's called a barrel vault. Or you, you could interconnect uh, or intersect those barrel vaults and form what is called a groin vault. Or we could have a fenestrated groin with um, what are known as clerestory window, windows that allow in light. Fenestrated is just a fancy word for it has windows. Or you could take an arch and sort of spin it around 360 degrees and create a dome. All of these structures are based on the same sort of principle of the arch. That you have, that the, the pressure is pushed outwards and downwards, or what is um, known as sublimated, uh, down the length of the arch, or in, in, in the case uh, over here on the right, a dome. Okay, pretty cool stuff, right? So let's look at some Roman Republican era sculpture. So the image on the left, immediately you should be thinking, well, that looks pretty darn Greek. And yes, it, it, it does, doesn't it? But what's different is the lack of idealism. Classical Greek sculpture, as you guys remember, is all about ideal. The ideal. And it's about as, uh, uh, the human body, uh, representing the human body in, uh, in a way that is glorifying it, in a way that uh, represent it at its most perfect sort of state. But in Roman art, we see something rather different, at least in the faces. Uh, we don't usually see idealized faces, but instead we see realistic portraits of people. Uh, there's a word for this kind of truthfulness, and it's called verism, and it literally just means truthfulness. A lot of this comes from the fact that the Romans were trying very often in their sculptures to portray um, historical figures or important family members. For the Romans, the sort of ancestor worship is incredibly important to their worldview and their religious beliefs. And there was a deep pride in families and family lines and the patricians, in other words, the fathers the sort of, uh, of, of these families. And in fact, there were several holidays that the Romans celebrated where they would take out sculptures of their ancestors and they would parade them around and that's what this is happening here in this image. This is not a sculpture of a man carrying two severed heads, that would be weird, but instead it is a sculpture of a man carrying two busts of his ancestors as a way of honoring them. There is a truthfulness here to the, to, in the sculpture because the Romans wanted to capture what their ancestors looked like uh, for posterity, to honor that person as they really looked. And so we get a, a realism, a verism, uh, that we don't see in, uh, in Greek art, Greek classical art. Now the image on the left is rather interesting. This is a portrait of a Roman general. Um, but if we look at the man's face, which is very truthful, he looks like an older man, you know, a man in his late middle age, uh, perhaps. But if you look at his body, he is the body of a young Greek athlete. So. This is rather kind of funny to me, but that Roman truthfulness or verism stopped right about here at the neck. <laughs> 
if we look at the image of the uh, the guy on the right, um, you can see once again that verism I was talking about. And Roman sculptors became really, really good at portraying uh, sort of all of the different features of the human face. Um, the Romans kept slaves. It is a huge part of of um, Roman culture. By the end of the Republican period, there was something like two million slaves within a, a Roman land. And, and slavery was an important, although tragically sad, aspect of Roman society. Uh, Romans often... Um, uh, slaves could come from conquest. Slaves could also be people uh, coming from people who sold themselves into slavery to pay off debts. One generally could buy one's own freedom, but typically slaves kept their former masters' uh, names. And that's what we're seeing here. This is uh, the art of former slaves. Um, uh, but they, they kept the name of their former owner, their former master. So Publius Gessius is the original owner, and even though these men bought their freedom, uh, notice they adopted as their first names the last name of their, uh, the, their former owner. You know, when we look back at past societies, it's, it can be very difficult uh, because oftentimes the practices of, so, of those societies are diametrically opposed uh, ethically and morally to the standards by which we live today. But we also need to, um, you know, look at, at, at history with an eye for, well, using this word, verism, of truthfulness. And we can't gloss over some of the more horrific aspects of past societies. We have to accept them. We have to under, not accept them as in that they're good, but we have to accept that they existed. And we have to understand them within their context. That doesn't mean we have to like them. But certainly Romans practice slavery, and there's all sorts of art that references this. The, the portrait was really important in Roman culture, wasn't it? Um, because this idea of, of recording for posterity your face meant that it would be passed on by future generations as a way of honoring you. Around the first century, Rome moves from a republic to an empire, meaning they now have an emperor. They're still going to have their senate, um, but we are going to start to see some changes artistically in this period. Uh, but what I want to look at first is the city of Pompeii, um, because it is, of course, in Pompeii uh, in uh, 79 AD, the volcano this Mount Vesuvius erupted, leaving the city completely buried in um, layer after layer of ash. Now, while this was a tragic, horrific event, um, it is important um, for historical excavations because the city was left almost completely intact underneath this layer of ash. But the image that you're seeing here are not statues, but rather these are bodies that were preserved and literally sort of turned into ash as the, uh, the, the massive amount of ash from Mount Vesuvius uh, decimated the town. Uh, people were literally stopped in their tracks. Um, people were on the streets. You know, we see there's people who were walking their dogs. There are people who were sitting down reading. There were, I mean, just people in their normal everyday activities who were just blanketed by this ash. Pompeii, it is very much a kind of provincial, you know, not huge urban uh, sort of area. And so the art and architecture uh, from Pompeii isn't going to be as grand or as large as the architecture and art as we will see in Rome. But what makes it so significant is how well preserved it was. Rome is a city that's been, well, occupied and, you know, inhabited for, well, <laughs> since its creation. You know, Rome has changed and grown and old buildings have been torn down and added onto. And so there's very few Roman buildings that are preserved in their original state. Pompeii is like a snapshot a historical snapshot that allows us to see what Roman art and architecture was like at the late Republican, early imperial period. Okay, so here is a quick overview of the Forum of Pompeii. Forum is the literal center, uh, both political, religious, and oftentimes physical center 
of the town. The forum usually in well included the forum, which was this large public meeting area. It also, uh, and, and a place for uh, a marketplace, it included a temple. In this case, we have a temple to the main god, Jupiter, and then a basilica. A basilica is another large-scale sort of public uh, building. One of the main structures built in Pompeii is the amphitheater. Amphi meaning literally double or twice, so to amplify something literally means to double its volume. But the, the theater in Pompeii was made by piling up dirt. Uh, to create basically like an earthen bowl, and then the structure could be built inside of that. The, this bowl supported what were then the, the seats, the cavea they were called, and the wedge-shaped sections that divided up the seats called the cuneus. Um, the exits and entrances um, were, were stairs and uh, what were called vomitoria. A vomitoria is literally just an opening, it's a doorway, it's a, it's a channel for people to pass in and out. Um, and it's, of course, where we get the word vomit because, well, just as people exit through a vomitorium, so does their food exit and we vomit. It got, conversation got lovely in here, didn't it? We do see concrete used to make the outer wall, um, but it's not going to be used in the, in the structural way uh, that we will see in, in later works in, in Rome itself. Um, the outer wall of... Pompeii is created by what is called a blind arcade. A row of arches is called an arcade. A row of arches that lead nowhere, that basically uh, are there just for decorative purposes, uh, are called blind arcades. Sporting events were held in these, in these amphitheaters. We have a, a fresco from one of the walls uh, at a house in Pompeii that depicts this structure. It depicts a very famous event. A huge brawl broke out during um, a sporting event between Pompeii and a rival people called the Nusarians. And this led to a huge brawl that was so bad, actually, that it led to a 10-year ban on games. And if you look at the very top, there's this large cloth. This is called a velarium. And the velarium could be sort of pulled over the top of the Colosseum to provide shade. And this is a Colosseum that held 20,000 people, so this is a really big piece of fabric that would have been hauled out to uh, protect these people. But if you really want to start to understand the significance and the importance of Roman engineering, Pompeii is a pretty good place to start. The Egyptians couldn't have built this, the Greeks couldn't have built this, but the Romans certainly did. Let's look at some Roman houses. These kinds of houses weren't common in the city of Rome itself. Rome was much too densely po populated, so most people in ancient in the city of Rome uh, lived in apartments. What we see in smaller towns are, well, homes or houses. And this is a kind of a typical late Republican, early Imperial house. Um, not only were these places where people lived, but these were also uh, often businesses. The front uh, rooms of the house often housed businesses. Sometimes businesses run by the family or sometimes uh, these spaces were rented out to other individuals. So you have the entryway, the, the faucet or what's called the throat of the house. You have the sort of in, uh, central uh, meeting area called the atrium um, with a basin, a water basin that provided water for use. Uh, by the household, the impluvium, and then there were little cubic cubiculum off to the sides, and these were bedrooms. And then you had um, uh, a place where for ancestor shrines, the ala, and then you have an office area, the tabulum, you have a dining room, and then you have a uh, an outdoor sort of garden area uh, referred to uh, as the peristyle, and you guys know this word from ancient Greeks, peripteral or peristyle temples, colonnade around the perimeter of an area. This is the house of the Veti, a very important influential family in Pompeii. Uh, here we are in the Faustus, the foyer, the first room basically you walk into. So we're standing in the Faustus, looking in the atrium, and then you can see the pluvium. In pluvium here, um, this would have been, of course, filled with water. You can see there's a skylight overhead where water would come down and fill uh, the basin. You can also see off to the sides the various cubicula 
uh, the rooms. If we get to the very back of the house, um, this of course is here. This is the Paris style, and we can all we can see that. And this is a very fancy house. This is a house of a very powerful uh, family. So not all Pompeian houses would be like this, of course. But you can see we have this uh, rather beautiful garden area with the with the colonnade course around the perimeter. The walls of these houses were typically painted. These were frescoes. Frescoes, as you know, is a painting made with plaster. There are four major styles of, of painting that we find in Roman houses. And these really begin in sort of the late second century BC, and we're going to be looking at uh, Roman painting uh, up until really the first century AD, so, um, you know, around 200 years or so of, of Roman art. And just like modern day styles change, Roman styles changed. So the first style is often um, referred sometimes as a masonry style, although I, I often call it the faux finish style. But basically what it is is this. Um, this is the first style. And if you look closely, it, you might be fooled at first that it looks like marble or granite or other kinds of stone. But this is actually a painting. Um, this is what is known as the second style, which I call the illusionistic style. The second style uh, was meant to create the illusion that we are looking at a scene of nature or a group of people or architecture and it was painted in as realistic a manner as possible. And you can certainly see that in this room here uh, where we see these buildings painted on the wall and these sort of landscapes painted on the wall that give the illusion that you are looking into a garden or looking at a temple. The second style was actually quite impressive in its realism um, because the Romans started to develop something called linear or sometimes called one-point perspective. It's basically a mathematically precise way to create the illusion of realistic three-dimensional space. And it's based on this idea that uh, you have a horizon line and you have a point called the vanishing point. And then all of the objects appear to sort of meet at that vanishing point in the distance. We are looking at uh, a sort of small circular temple called a tholos painted in a rather illusionistic way. So it looks like we have a Tholos sitting in a three-dimensional courtyard. But second style painting wasn't just relegated to images of architecture and landscapes, but also we see images of people. This is a religious image. This is um, from another villa in Pompeii. And this is known as the Dionysian Mystery freeze. What does that mean? So Dionysus is the Greek and Roman god of wine. And, and there was a whole sort of cult associated with Dionysus, or what was known as a mystery religion. And, and mystery religion started to pop up in the, uh, uh, in the late Republican era of Rome. And these were often religions uh, based in, um, that came from the Middle East. And there were many different mystery religions, but the idea was that they sort of revolve around secret rites or secret practices or a secret kind of transformation um, that um, was basically a mystery that, that couldn't be sort of understood uh, with uh, sort of normal logic, but instead uh, refer to something magical or mystical and we are looking at a rite or a ceremony performed. What exactly that ceremony entailed, we're not really sure. There's not a lot of writings that exist, that still exist from this particular cult of Dionysus, but um, it, it's, it certainly involves an initiation where people are being flogged or whipped. But look at the figures here. Once again, we have that Roman Verism. Um, this, this, you know, we don't have a lot of these Roman frescoes that survived within Rome itself. And so like so much of Pompeii, uh, it gives us access to Roman art and architecture intact, Roman art and architecture in a way that we wouldn't have or we don't have. So let's take a look at the third style. This is much more decorative. It emphasizes the flatness of the wall. It is not illusionistic. This is like the opposite 
of the second style. And so here is the th a third style wall. This is a close up of an image from the third style, but this is what the wall looked like. It's very decorative. It is um, almost abstract. Um, although we see the use of columns here, but these are impossibly thin columns. But there's more of an emphasis on decoration. There's an emphasis on geometric forms and patterns. Sometimes we might see small sorts of images um, used in a decorative way within a um, third style painting, as you see as this little image here of uh, this little villa architecture. But for the most part, the emphasis on third style is on patterns and geometry. And then we have the final style, the fourth style. And I like to refer to this as the kitchen sink style. And I forgot to mention the third style. Um, I, I usually just call the decorative style. <clears throat> but the fourth style, I like to call the kitchen sink, sink style because it's a little bit of everything. Um, this comes from uh, Nero's palace, the Emperor Nero's palace in Rome. Um, but you'll notice it's a little bit of everything. We have like the sort of faux finish of the... Uh, first style. We have the illusionism of the second style. We have the decorative geometric qualities of the third style, all thrown together into a kind of hodgepodge, a kitchen sink, a little bit of everything in here. That is the fourth style. And, and fourth style images often would create sort of the uh, large-scale illusionistic images of the second style sort of put them in a frame, like a, a sort of a third style frame, as you can see here in this image uh, from the Greek mythology. Oh, but look at the, look at the realism here. Look at the um, three-dimensional quality of the figures. Uh, but what I really want to focus on here is this wonderful image from Pompeii. Uh, this comes from um, a house of a man who was probably a baker. He was young, he was newlywed, and what we are looking at here is um, a portrait. This comes from a much larger, larger fourth style wall, so imagine a bunch of other things around it. This is, shows um, this young man and his wife, relatively newly, uh, newly married, shown together in this sort of marital portrait. Um, now, keep in mind that they would have probably been killed during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, it's, it's, there's something really haunting about this image to me. Now, this young couple, they're up and coming. They're establishing themselves in the world, they, and they want to show off their money. They want to show off their wealth. They want to show off their education. And so we see the man holding a, a scroll. Um, a sign of his education, a sign of his ability to read. Although he may or may not have been able to read, sometimes people were shown um, with writing implements and with written with a written word, even though they might have actually been illiterate, but it was a status symbol. And then his wife is holding a, a, a wax tablet known as a pugilare. Pugilare comes from the Latin word meaning fist. And uh, you might have heard of a boxer referred to as a pugilist, and this is where we get the word. Um, pugilare means fist, um, but this is also used to describe a tablet that was held in the fist. And these were wax tablets, and so these were usually made from wood with a layer of wax inside of it. And then uh, a, a student could take the, uh, uh, the stylus, the writing instrument, and scratch the writing into the wax tablet. These people are really, really, really trying to show that they are educated, that they are urbane, that they are sort of up and coming in the world. It's a, it's a haunting image knowing that they probably were buried under tons and tons and tons of ash. But this tradition actually comes from images of, of poets. Um, there was a whole tradition that actually started in Greece of, of portraits, of seated portraits of poets. And here we see an image of, an, of an, a poet named Meander sitting in a chair holding his work. 
um, showing that he is an educated man, a man of letters. Um, so this was a big influence on these kinds of portraits in, in, Roman, uh, in the Roman culture. But also, um, and I'm just sort of planting a seed here, these, these author portraits will have a big influence in the Middle Ages when we start to see the depictions of the writers of the Gospels of the New Testament. And uh, we're going to see early Christians borrow this image of the sort of the author portrait and use it to depict um, the Gospel writers of the Bible. The Romans really were starting to experiment with with painting in a way to make it as look as realistic as possible, to make it look as illusionistic as possible. And they would create these paintings that uh, attempted to be something called we call a trompe l'oeil, or a fool the eye. That's what it means in French. It's this, it's this technique, um, you know, to create illusionistic images. So, you know, uh, the idea was that, you know, you could paint an apple so real that people would think it was a real apple. And what's really amazing here is this image of water. This is, to my knowledge, the first real attempt of any artist to explore the qualities of, of, of light passing through water. And if we look over here at this leaf especially, you can see that it is shifted in the water because water refracts light. And you've all seen this phenomenon. You put a straw in water and it looks broken. Well. Here we have an artist trying to replicate that phenomenon. But Romans, more than the Greeks, really tried to replicate the way the world really looked. They didn't quite get it right. They were learning how to do it. But their, this verism, this truthfulness, really pushed their, their art to new heights in terms of realism. All right, so that's where we're going to stop for today. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to look really get in, into the Roman imperial period and, and look at the massive changes, um, not just politically and culturally, but of course artistically, uh, that occurred during that period. All right, see you then.